The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. John the Baptist made an extraordinary declaration when he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. What did John mean by this? To understand the significance of his words, you have to know that in Bible days, in the Jerusalem temple, there were daily animal sacrifices as a sin offering to God. These sacrifices went back to the time of Moses, where God had instructed the Jewish people when, where, and how to conduct these offerings. The shedding of blood to atone for sins was foreshadowed in an even earlier time of history when Abraham offered to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. Today I'm going to look at the spiritual significance of a landmark turning point in Jewish life, the observance of Passover, and its meaning for you. Hello, I'm Christine Darg. The night before the Israeli nation left the slavery of Egypt in order for their firstborn to be saved from the angel of death, every Hebrew family had to eat the Passover lamb and smear the lamb's blood over their doorposts. When the angel of death saw that symbolic blood marking, that house became a safe house. This was a prophetic picture of the blood shed by Jesus upon the wood of the cross centuries later. And it's remarkable how the Passover celebration ties in with the final days of Jesus' earthly life. He also had a Passover meal with his disciples and would then be sacrificed just as John describes him. Behold, the Lamb of God. Before the Jewish festival of Passover, Jesus said to his disciples, With great desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. To understand the Lord's heart and why this meal was so symbolic and important to him, we have to do a background search into the deep meaning of Passover. Just as Christians enjoy a Christmas feast and Americans anticipate a Thanksgiving meal, the Jews enjoy the Passover holiday meal each year in the springtime. The meal is called a Seder. Seder means order, because during the meal there's a liturgy, an order of service, to remember Israel's freedom and deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Now keep this in mind. Jesus died on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, and the Passover holiday begins on the 15th day of Nisan. There's hardly a Jewish home anywhere in the world that doesn't celebrate some kind of a Seder in honor of the holiday. As I said, Seder means order because the entire night follows a script known as the Haggadah. Haggadah means recital. The Seder is an elaborate dinner with elements on a festive Seder plate. It's held on the first night of Passover in which the narrative of the exodus from slavery to freedom is told in detail. Seder night has been a way of teaching that portion of the Bible to families from generation to generation. And the idea of spring cleaning is attached to the holiday because unleavened bread is required by God during Passover's week-long festival of unleavened bread. And therefore, every Jewish household must rid itself of all leaven. The festive meal is the most elaborate meal of the year in Jewish homes. They believe Seder night is a holy night, when the holiness of God returns to earth to recount the Exodus. The meal has many steps. First is the Kedush, the blessing of the wine. Family members are invited to dip vegetables in salt water. That's reminiscent of the tears of God's people when they were in bondage to slavery. Mysteriously, and listen with spiritual ears to the symbolism I'm going to tell you, 
There are three pieces of matzah bread put in a ceremonial cloth, and the middle piece is broken. The middle broken matzah is wrapped in a napkin and hidden away to be the dessert at the end of the meal. The next step is the reciting of the Passover story, which rehearses the ten plagues. And next is the blessing of the matzah bread, followed by the eating of bitter herbs and a matzah sandwich that's stuck together with a sticky paste that symbolizes the bricks and mortars of slavery. After feasting on the holiday meal, the dessert, that broken piece of matzah that was hidden in its shroud somewhere in the room, is searched for by the children. And what do you think that broken matzah bread wrapped in a napkin and hidden away suggests? Yeshua, that's Jesus' Hebrew name, is the broken, sinless bread of life come down from heaven. He was buried in a shroud and will be discovered someday by the entire Jewish family. Finally, at the Seder meal, grace is said afterwards and psalms are read. And at the conclusion of the evening, there are prayers to believe next year in Jerusalem. But really, we no longer need to say next year in Jerusalem because the Jewish people have been restored to their land. And there's a continual call from Jerusalem to come home now. There's also lots of singing on Seder night and children play a central role asking questions. Another tradition sets an empty chair at every Passover Seder meal for Elijah because God will send Elijah back to earth before the coming of the Lord. Most Seders don't end before midnight. One rabbi said that Passover is a time to free ourselves from the bondage of everyday living and to bond with our Creator and our family, to laugh, cry, sing and dance. It's a time to share and even to disagree and argue a bit because that's the Jewish way of discussions. Now let's shift to the New Testament in Jerusalem. Jesus brought a new revelation to the Passover story. The Gospels detail the Seder meal. For example, in Mark chapter 14, Yeshua sends two of his disciples to find a man carrying a jar of water. He said the man would show them a large upper room furnished and ready. So they went to prepare the Passover, and when evening came, Yeshua arrived with the twelve, and the accounts say that they reclined at table. One of the traditions that evolved around the annual Seder was to recline at table because this was a picture of being free men. The action of reclining demonstrated that they were no longer slaves. And so this was a tradition that Yeshua and his disciples also kept. Now let's zoom in closer and examine some of the elements on the Lord's Seder table. We have matzah, the memorial bread that was made in haste because of the exodus from Egypt, and this bread had no time to rise. While they were eating, Mark chapter 14, verse 22 says that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, amazingly, Take it and eat. This is my body. With this amazing saying, Yeshua gave the matzah bread a new meaning. Matzah is unleavened, made without yeast, because yeast is an idiom in the Bible representing sin. So Yeshua redefines the meaning of matzah as representing his body that would be bruised and broken for our sins. Also, part of a traditional Seder is consuming various ceremonial glasses of wine. Some scholars say that there were three cups during the time of Yeshua. Others say four. The Lord gave new meaning to the cup of redemption. Up to this time, the cup represented redemption out of Egypt. But now, Yeshua updates the script and redefines the cup as representing his blood that will institute the new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31 
and verse 31. Let's look at that in the Old Testament. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This Lord's cup at the last Seder now becomes the cup of redemption in his blood through the new covenant. He took the cup and said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. As the meal continues, let's look at Matthew the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, which describes the Seder, and verse 23. Here Jesus says, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. That indicates Judas was given a seat of honor near to Jesus. This action of Judas dipping his hand into the same bowl with Yeshua refers again to the traditional Seder meal because a specific observance during the meal was to dip the matzah bread into bitter herbs. So this wasn't Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, but it was an authentic Jewish Passover Seder. The Lord brought new and greater meaning to its elements and made it a memorial of his death. The Lord's Last Seder became a meal that no longer only remembers the exodus out of Egypt, but also the exodus out of sin into eternal life for all who will put their trust in the Savior. I hope you can see that. Now let's look further into these mysteries revealed in the New Testament. Although Jesus was falsely accused of being a glutton and a drunkard because he was willing to associate with sinners, the Gospels don't portray him as a man normally given to appetite. Yet Jesus especially anticipated and looked forward to eating this particular Passover meal before his suffering and death. Let's examine the Lord's intense desire expressed in Luke chapter 22 and verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you that I shall not eat this meal again, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. With desire, I have desired, is an idiomatic expression in Hebrew, meaning intense desire, meaning I have greatly desired. Let's try to imagine some of the reasons why Yeshua intensely anticipated this meal. I can think of at least three important reasons. Reason number one is a human reason, nostalgia. Don't forget Jesus was human as well as God, and as Israel's greatest native son, he valued the festivals of the Lord. He also appreciated the blessings of social events. Don't forget that his first miracle was performed at a wedding. And never forget that Jesus was a Jew, and for three decades, both as a child and as an adult, Jesus had enjoyed going up to Jerusalem for this festive meal as was his family's custom. So many memories and thoughts must have crowded his mind as he contemplated the deep significance of all that this last meal symbolized. Progressively, the Lord had realized that he would be the prophetic fulfillment, even the embodiment of the Passover symbolism. Because he knew as he was about to make his own exodus from this world, Yeshua desired both the fellowship and the solace of being together with his closest friends and of sharing of the privileges of his Jewish heritage. One of life's greatest pleasures is, after all, looking forward to a gathering around a table with people we love and cherish. But also, very importantly, Yeshua would draw physical strength from this meal to be able to endure the ordeal he would soon face. His agony in the Garden of Gethsemane when he wrestled in prayer to the point that he sweat great drops of blood. It gave him strength for his arrest, his trial, the horrific flogging and crucifixion. Now, I think the second reason that Yeshua had looked forward to this Passover Seder was 
the opportunity to prepare the apostles for his sufferings and to impress upon their minds more fully the certainty that he was soon to be betrayed and crucified. He greatly desired that they might be mentally, emotionally, and physically prepared for the shock and ordeal to come. And a third, and perhaps the greatest reason that Yeshua desired to host this Passover Seder is that he knew he was about to change its ancient time-honored liturgy. He intended to institute the Lord's Supper, a most solemn and awesome event. He would rewrite the Jewish script that had been rehearsed for generations. For centuries, the Jews had said concerning the unleavened bread, this is the bread of affliction. Now Yeshua would amplify the bread of affliction with its full meaning. This is my body broken for you. Even today, the unleavened bread called matzah is pierced through and striped like the body of Yeshua. That was broken, striped, and bruised during his passion to make atonement for the world. Concerning the Passover wine, Yeshua also changed the liturgy. He said, this is the blood of the Brit Tahadashah, the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said he wouldn't drink the cup of redemption again until this Seder would be upgraded into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thus, Yeshua predicted that the ancient Passover Seder would undergo two glorious changes. First of all, at his first coming, the Passover meal was upgraded to the Lord's Supper to memorialize our exodus from sin. And he said at his second coming, the Lord's table will be upgraded again when he will drink wine with us in the kingdom of God. That will be the glorious marriage supper of the Lamb, when God's eternal purposes will be victoriously culminated. Hallelujah. Well, the drama at Yeshua's Passover table would not be easily digested. His words sounded radical and new, yet it was the plan of God from the foundation of the world. All of his sufferings were the expression of love towards his people and concern for their redemption. Just as the first Passover meal in Egypt was a prophetic picture of the deliverance of God's chosen people, Yeshua's Eucharistic Passover was celebrated as a prophetic picture of salvation for all of mankind. Think about this. The burden upon Yeshua's spirit at that moment must have been incredible. This was no ordinary Passover Seder. He orchestrated every detail, and in the mix, he would also be forced by circumstances to teach his squabbling disciples who was the greatest. He set the example by taking a towel and bowl and washing their feet at the Seder. And on top of it all, while instituting the Lord's Supper, he also had to deal with the heartache of the betrayal of Judas. As they ate, he revealed, Truly I tell you, one of you shall betray me. Yeshua said this as he offered the best morsel to Judas. Judas was caught up in this drama, but tragically didn't see the bigger picture. But on the other hand, the Apostle Paul, who started out greatly opposing the Lord and persecuting the early church, eventually understood. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verses 7 to 8, Paul said, Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, Paul said, let us keep the feasts, not with old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. And when Jesus was asked by the scribes and Pharisees to give them a sign that would prove he was the Messiah, he gave them a brilliant answer. 
Jesus said the only sign he would give the Pharisees was the sign of the prophet Jonah. And what's the meaning of this riddle? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul the Pharisee stated that Yeshua died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was, ra that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And how many days was Jonah buried in the belly of the fish? Three days. So let's look at the chronology of events leading up to the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. The Jewish people were part of this drama knowingly and unknowingly. Yeshua, our Passover lamb, was purchased from the chief priests by his betrayer, Judas Iscariot, for 30 pieces of silver. And as our Jerusalem brother, Michael Cohen of blessed memory, often taught us in our previous Passover convocations, in the days of Jesus, there were actually two Passover celebrations on two consecutive nights. The celebration by a sect called the Essenes began one night earlier than the celebration of the two main parties the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Passover of the Pharisees and Sadducees began on Friday evening, but the Essenes Passover began on Thursday evening. Although Jesus was not known to be an Essene, he nevertheless staged his last Seder one night earlier on Thursday night because as our sacrificial Passover lamb, he would not be alive the following evening, Friday evening. He would already be dead by then. And so he celebrated Passover on Thursday night because he must fulfill all the Bible types and shadows. Michael Cohen taught us that there was no lamb on the table at Yeshua's last Seder because Yeshua was the lamb at the table. After the Seder, Yeshua was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the middle of the night, in a trumped-up illegal trial, the court of the Jewish elders, called the Sanhedrin, decided that Yeshua was worthy of death because they said he had blasphemed God by claiming to be the Son of God when he was testifying under oath. Early Friday morning, Yeshua was led to Pontius Pilate the Roman governor of Judea, who had jurisdiction. He was taken back and forth between Pilate and King Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. But he was scourged and condemned to death by Pilate and crucified at nine o'clock in the morning. The Passover lambs were slaughtered from nine in the morning until three o'clock in the evening when the high priest shouted, it is finished. This was the exact time that Yeshua was suffering on the cross to make atonement. And when he also shouted himself from the cross that the work of atonement was finished at the time of the evening sacrifice. Before dying, Yeshua shouted, It is finished, meaning the sin debt for mankind had been paid in full on the cross. He didn't die a victim he gave up his spirit into the hands of God when all things, including the prophecies in Psalm 22, were accomplished. He was taken down from the cross and quickly buried nearby in a garden before sundown because the regular Passover was beginning that evening. And Yeshua arose from the grave on Saturday evening, which is in Hebraic thinking, Sunday morning. You see, according to Jewish thinking, late Saturday night was actually Sunday morning. This is because in the Torah, in Genesis chapter 1, it states, the evening and the morning were one day. So please understand that the Jewish day starts not with the morning, but with the evening. Therefore, on Sunday morning, the risen Lord presented himself to the Father, as the first fruits from the dead. The timing was impeccable, planned by God. 
The Jewish holiday of first fruits is held during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These are deep mysteries, types and shadows, and the Lord fulfilled them all. In the Resurrection Garden, Mary Magdalene sees the risen Lord, but at that point she's not allowed to touch him because he's not yet ascended to the Father. Early Sunday morning, Yeshua then ascends to the Father and presents himself as the first fruits from the dead. Then he returns to earth for 40 days to appear to his disciples and to continue teaching. Now here's something important. Did you know that high holy days in Judaism are also called Sabbaths? This is whether or not they occur on a Saturday. Jesus died on Friday and rose on a Sunday. So how could he have been in the grave for three days? This has stumped many. But Israeli God Natanel Nichols solves the mystery for us by explaining that Yeshua died on the eve of a double Sabbath. The Friday of his death was followed that year by two Sabbaths. The regular Saturday Sabbath also doubled as a holiday Sabbath because that year the Sabbath happened to be the first day of Passover. So the riddle is solved, adding up to three days and three nights. Holy Saturday, when Yeshua lay in the tomb, is a double Sabbath. This doesn't happen, as I said, every year. But according to the Hebraic lunar calendar, it happened the year that Yeshua died. Obviously, every year Passover doesn't begin on a Friday evening. But when it does, it creates two Sabbath holidays. It's something to ponder. Well, I'm so grateful for this time to share these scriptural revelations with you. And meanwhile, more importantly, I urge you to invite the Holy Spirit into your life and to call on the name of our great God and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, while there is yet time before his reappearing as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, he's returning soon to judge the entire earth. And only those who are found in the ark of safety, that is, only those who are in the Lord Jesus the Messiah, will be kept eternally safe. The Bible teaches that all who call upon the Passover lamb, Yeshua, shall be saved. His blood made the eternal atonement for us at Passover. Praise his name forever. I also invite you to send me any questions through the social media, or you can contact me through our website where you can sign up for our news and videos at exploits.tv. We'd also like to offer you a free copy of our newly expanded Exploits magazine with 24 pages of Bible insights. Just request a copy on our website. So, proclaiming the Lord is risen and once again contending for the faith, I'm Christine Darg, an evangelist of the empty tomb in Jerusalem. Shalom. One of my long-held intentions has been to share more Bible insights with you in print. That's why we've just revamped our Exploits magazine by expanding it into a booklet of at least 24 pages. This gives us the opportunity to go into depth on topics that will give you a better understanding of the Bible and hopefully deepen your faith. The Exploits News Magazine is available just for the asking, either in print format or through the internet. To request your free copy, just contact me by phone, letter, email, or through our website. Our toll-free number in the United States is 1-888-245-2692. And in the UK, it's 0843-557-4077. Thanks to your continued support of the Jerusalem Channel, we can bring you our video teachings and now our new magazine booklet. Have a browse through it and let me know what you think.